Hello. Sorry I'm late. Kevin was talking. It's time for news about, about the news. Whoopsie. My, my commercial on my video just popped on. Kevin was uh, yakking my ears off. Um, okay. How is everybody doing? It might have been nice and warm by you. It wasn't that warm by me. Not like 70. Um, but I, we did take a walk. That was nice. Uh, Ethan actually went fishing in a boat. In a boat? Yesterday it was weird because when I went on my walk yesterday... I could see across the lake, and it seemed still to be frozen, but you could see it thawing in places, and I thought, like, just like a wacky thought, like somebody that would say, oh, let me see if I can make it across, you know. Anyway, um, today it was, like, thawed, and they told me yesterday they took the boat out. When their friend was here, they got the boat out in another place. So, but today Ethan was able to go and take the boat out. So it's funny, one minute they're ice fishing, now they have the boat out. But it's still frozen in some places. Hello, White Angel. White Angel, I am um, getting your boxes uh, together for the stuff that I've already uh, billed you for. I'm going to finish that tomorrow. I already got my list of what I'm going to do. Sandra M., I sent you a request. I sent a, a, quite a few people request today, and five packages went out today. I have two more that are ready to go out tomorrow, and White Angel, I... Um, should get back to you with the shipping on that and then we can get those out and then we can start on the, the new stuff but um, so I was productive with that as well and I made a, another painting video a few other painting videos uh, what else did I do today and um, just doing the my daughter got uh, some good news about something that was good let's see you just finished your day and sat down. Yeah, and there is some crime talk here, some really weird crime talk. We're going to talk about the dad that uh, Linda Uribe was speaking about last night. Linda, are you here? That made some uh, mango smoothies, or, or you know, he laced them, let's say that. He laced mango smoothies and was going to serve them and serve them to 12-year-olds at a sleepover. And thank goodness, um, well, one of them started to feel funny or something and, and thwarted his uh, plan. But then the North Carolina case of a mother, you know, charged with killing her four-year-old twins, you know, um, craziness there still... No updates that I see on uh, either Madeline Soho or little Elijah View, which is um, strange. Now, they just said I saw recently they pulled a body from a Wisconsin River, but I believe it was an adult. I'm going to have to go back and check that out. Um, what else is going on? Hi, Ashley Vestal. Your daughter found out that she and her husband are getting a foster child this week. Wait, wait, wait. Back that up for a minute. Back that up. How could your, your daughter got married? Wait a minute. Ashley, wasn't your daughter like, wasn't she in school? Wait a minute, I thought she was like 15 or something. I thought she, the last time, like when you came on with all that stuff with that guy with the roses, that your daughter was like, oh, okay, wait a second, I'm lost. I didn't, I'm blanking that you had another daughter. Wait a minute, I'm blanking. I'm blanking out here, Ashley. Remind me because I'm blanking out. Hi, Linda Uribe. I am totally blanking out. You have an older one. I, why don't I remember that? I, that's crazy. I'm sorry, I don't remember that. But that's not, the younger one is with the husband that changed genders, right? Am I correct? The one you came and told your story? 
Katie is 29, and Zoe just turned, oh wow, she's 19? I didn't even realize she was that old yet either, 19. Maybe I remember it now. Okay, I don't know why I'm blanking out on that. So they're getting a foster child? That's great. Do you know the age? Are they getting a um, baby, or are they... Oh, I think I remember now. I, ugh, I don't know. I blanked on that. Freshman in college. Okay, gotcha. Zero to six. Okay, good. Keep us posted. Um, yeah, Linda Ruby, I hope your son's on the men there. I'm going to go pull up this info, but... Let me see here. Oh. See, there was a body pulled. Let me just see. I'm just going to see what this is. They say a body was uh, discovered over the weekend on the Wisconsin-Minnesota border body was located along Lakefront Park on the Wisconsin side of the river north of I-94 bridge. So I'm not sure. I don't think um, Meanwhile, there has been no word of whether the body was of an adult or a child. And the discovery happened amid the desperate search for three-year-old Elijah View. Okay, so it's weird that they mentioned that right with Elijah View and they're not telling us. Let me just check out like one of the social media groups about that and just see if anybody thinks that they might. Sometimes they have a little bit of, uh, you know what I mean? Somebody somewhere. Heard something, right? Okay, somebody said, what is this about? Vehicle of interest I doubt, okay, so there is, let me see, they're saying that a vehicle of interest, let me see, where is this? The Two Rivers Police Chief is asking home and business owners to check their surveillance video systems for a car that he described as a vehicle of interest. In an email press release Monday, Chief Ben Minart, Minart, said a beige 1997 four-door Nissan Altima. They have it in their possession, but they want people to check their video databases for video of the vehicle on February 19th, 2 p.m. and 9, between 2 p.m. and 9 p.m. Due to the duration of the hours requested, we are asking the public beyond the greater Two Rivers area and adjacent counties to review their videos as well. Well, great. By now, that's probably been looped over. Probably. The vehicle has Wisconsin. Here's the uh, vehicle. The 
vehicle has Wisconsin license plates beginning with A and ending with zero. The time frame the chief targeted is from the night before the boyfriend of Elijah View's mother reported the three-year-old missing. So what happened there and how did that get discovered as a vehicle of interest, hmm? And it doesn't look... It's rusted out. Hmm. Okay. So let's see what they're saying about this car. When did they get this car? Most people's cameras only go back 10 days, right? If this is one of the cars they towed over a week ago, the info should have been in the public last week when people still had their footage. Let's see. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. So, let's see. Okay, so somebody, I wanted to be a father figure. I've been talking to my sister every day for a year now. He gave her a car and really got, okay, now somebody is saying that this is the brother, I guess, of Elijah's mother and wrote a post. Now again, take it with grain of salt, right? Just so everyone knows, Jesse is a criminal. He mysteriously came into her life three weeks ago and wanted to be a father figure to Elijah. Now that doesn't jive with what um, she has said because she has said he has, uh, Elijah has gone to Thing's house before, but just not that long, right? And wanted to be a father figure to Elijah. I've been talking to my sister every day for a year now. He gave her a car really got her to believe he wanted to be there for Elijah. I have all the texts from Trina in the last month. She never once said that she wanted him to discipline Elijah. She wanted him to be a positive male role model. And then he says, Jimmy is in prison for trying to kill Trina and Alina. Jimmy and Jesse sold Trina the mother into s trafficking seven years ago they are not good people jesse has a good attorney right now and the police are definitely tricking her into saying these things wake up people i have hundreds of videos of trina and elijah from this past year they were inseparable she loved that kid i have no idea how this guy convinced her that he should watch her son well that does go with her facebook page right Trina needs to stop trusting the police because they are twisting everything. I don't know. Let me see what said about this. It doesn't make sense. Jesse supposedly helped Jimmy sell her into S trafficking, but she wanted Jesse to be a positive role model for her son. That doesn't make any sense at all either. Right? So, um,. say somebody said that is her brother it's been confirmed by her mother that is her brother 
Somebody said, maybe it's her brother, but that doesn't make me believe what he's saying is true. Okay. Okay, and it says 11 days prior then, uh, to Elijah going missing. Jimmy filed with the Court of Appeals. Maybe just a coincidence, but if they're in cahoots together, blah, 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 blah. Um, Yeah, somebody said, yeah, he, it's conflicting because you say that he just came into her life three weeks ago, but then you say prior to this, they sold her into S trafficking seven years ago. But she, what do you mean, just came into her life three years ago? I mean, three weeks ago. Very strange. Very strange. There's a $15,000 reward now for anything um, about uh, missing Elijah View. Eighteen hours ago, Elijah View's family pauses search efforts today and Tuesday. Uh oh, they're pausing search efforts. And there was a body pulled from that river. I don't know. I don't know. Why are they pausing search efforts? What did they, or maybe they found something in that car. Something in that car that, I don't know, something's happened. Something's happened. Yep. weird. Why would they call the search off for two days? I don't know. Something's wacky. They either found something in that car, and now that car is, you know, they're looking, you know, um, hmm. All right. Well. Very sad. All right, let me go to... Let's talk about the mother in North Carolina right now. All right. So, Genevieve Springer. Five foot five. She's been arrested and charged after the death of her four-year-old twin boys. Okay, let's go to the statement from the Sh Cherokee County Sheriff's Office. And this is the official statement, okay? <clears throat> and it says, on March 2nd, 2024, the Cherokee 
County Sheriff's Office and the Cherokee County Emergency Services responded to a 911 call at 75 Gooseberry Road in Murphy, North Carolina. Let's see what that looks like. doesn't want to give us a street view, huh? Let me see now if we can get it. Well, the best I, I can do is show you. It's right here. Right there. Okay, so the reporting party was a Cherokee County father. So the father of the twins who had arrived home to the home of his separated wife to exercise custody of his four-year-old twin sons around 10 a.m. that day. When he arrived, upon his arrival, he discovered his twin sons deceased. Wow. An investigation followed, which included Cherokee County Sheriff's Office deputies and detectives, agents of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, and the assistant district attorneys from the office of Ashley Welch. Genevieve Ellen Springer, the mother of the deceased twins, was hospitalized in North Georgia and charged with two counts of first-degree murder by the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office upon release from the hospital on March 2nd. 2024, Springer was arrested in Union County, Georgia. In Union County, Georgia? Why was she arrested in Union County, Georgia? Huh. Springer waived extradition and was transported to the Cherokee County Detention Center on March 3rd, where she is currently being held without bond. The date and time of death is currently under investigation. Upon information and belief, the last time the Cherokee County father saw his twin sons alive was February 26th, according to the date of the offense of the warrants is currently a range of February 26th through March 2nd. The Cherokee County Sheriff's Office is hopeful that the autopsies will narrow down the date and time of the twins passing. In the wake of the tragedy, Sheriff Dustin D. Smith is asking for prayers for the for the victims' families and all the first responders involved. Uh, let's see. Sheriff Smith would like to remind our county that our children are our most precious resource and our hope for the future. We must all stand united for their protection and for justice. A critical incident. Debriefing will be held for all first responders involved. A critical incident debriefing is a facilitator-led group process conducted soon after a traumatic event. Hold on a minute, my mouse was um, soon after a traumatic event. Where did my mouse just go? Let's go. A traumatic event with individuals considered to be under stress from trauma exposure. All individuals are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Okay, so, um, well, okay, let's see what we can, let me just get. Huh. 
Let's see. Hmm. Why can't I find this? Guys, right, stop. I was trying to see if she had a, no, I don't see anything for her on social media, but now let's go to, um, we'll find, we'll keep covering that. Let's go to the dad and the smoothies, okay? And like I said, Linda Uribe, you said about this uh, yesterday, and yeah, new details are coming out about it. It's crazy. Here's the guy. This is in Oregon. And so what, um, oh, let's see here. Let's get back to the, uh, so he and his wife divorced last year, but owned a home in Lake Oswego. And it's so funny that there's a Lake Oswego out there because we have a Lake Oswego and Oswego um, here in New York State, but that's you know I mean there we have the same scooter has a lot of the same towns that we do, and uh, several several states have similar uh, city names, right? Anyway, so he uh, they had a um, sleepover, okay, and one of the twelve-year-old girls who was allegedly given this uh, drug-laced mango smoothie by her friend's dad at this sleepover, said that the dad was doing tests to see if they were conscious while they pretended to sleep. Um, and that child desperately texted a family friend begging for a ride from that Lake Oswego home and saying that her friend's dad, who was 57, the man you see here on the screen, was making her feel unsafe he had coerced her and two other girls into drinking the smoothies, and he had laced them with a benzodiazepine. And that is a depressant that slows the nervous system. And that's from the probable cause affidavit. So the unidentified girl wrote in the text, and I quote, so I'm sleeping and her dad comes down and I'm hugging one of the other girls because she was so scared and he kept moving us away from each other but kept doing tests to make sure we weren't awake. Also, the other girl won't wake up and she did for like two seconds, but she kept her eyes closed and didn't talk. The girl added, and then the family friend said, she's gonna pick her up. When the friend arrived, the girl stood to get their things and the dad came, she said he seemed drunk, slurred his speech in response to her leaving, but did not try to stop her. Then he turned himself in at the Clackamas County Jail on Wednesday after a grand jury issued an indictment accusing him of multiple felonies and misdemeanors stemming from the August 26th sleepover from hell. The girls told police that he used a very loud door to retrieve her shoes from the garage while fleeing and became concerned that she had used one when one of the other girls didn't wake up when she slammed the door. Okay. But after the girl was brought home by the family friend, she woke her parents up who decided to drive to his house at 3 a.m. to retrieve the two other girls. At the hospital the next day, one of the girls told the Lake Oswego police, Detective Nicole Palmieri, that she still felt hot, woozy, and clumsy, while another child said she couldn't recall what occurred upon blacking out. One of the three girls whose mother said she was typically a light sleeper described falling into a thick, thick sleep that she had never experienced before. The same girl was unable to walk upon getting home and had to be carried inside the house where she repeatedly asked what happened before the parents decided to bring her to the hospital. Hold on, I've got to let the dog out. And um, so, yeah, hold on, I'll be right back. Somebody's something to pull out. I'm
Lulu, want wow. Want wow. got something to catch outside. I don't know what they hear outside, but they're on guard duty. Guard duty. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, so let's go back. So now they, the girls go home. The parents get woken up. They go back, get the other two girls. They're at the hospital. Telling them I feel hot, woozy. Described uh, one of the three girls whose mother said she is typically a light sleeper described falling into a thick Deep sleep that she had never experienced before The same girl was unable to walk upon getting home had to be carried inside the house where she repeatedly asked what happened Before her parents decided to bring her to the hospital Police observed that one of the girls walked slowly and used the assistance of her mother for balance her eyelids were heavy and she spoke softly. None of the girls of, or their families were particularly close with the Maiden family or had been at their home before the sleepover, which Maiden had arranged because his then wife's primary language is Japanese. Hmm, this looks like somebody I've seen before, but I don't recognize the name. Um, Maiden faces charges including causing another person to ingest a controlled substance and application of a controlled substance to another person. So what about his own daughter? Um, that's just creepy, isn't it? Uh, let's see here. Rapey. So Michael Maiden, 57. Michael Maiden, 57. Does he have a social media profile? Seeing that there. Okay, let's see. So there were three 12 year old girls there. They don't say about his own daughter. It looks like he did have a Facebook, but it's either been set to private or it's been deactivated. Um, Something 
just leaving me with the headset. Oh, I know what I was going to do. Hang on. Texas woman divorced her husband. Okay. Let me go over here to this. See if there's anything. Uh, in court documents, let's see here. The girls said that Michael Maiden had become very involved in their activities during the sleepover. He was constantly checking in on them and interjecting himself into their conversations. Okay, let me see here. Don't want that much out oh, So this happened back in August and yeah, I guess it's just hit the news now, right? So let's see here. Now, Kevin wanted me to look into trial that began today. Just trying to see before I go on that. If there's anything I want to touch on before that. All right, so let me, I think Michelle Traconis is going, might be in having a hearing tomorrow for in the contempt hearing. Okay, let me go to look at that trial.
Okay, so let's take a look. Knoxville, Tennessee. Let me just get a graphic up there. Hold on one second. Yeah, her name is Robin Howington. Robin Howington. And I'm just trying to get up. graphic up here so we know if I do uh, split this into chapters I know where we begin and where we end and we need to make her smaller okay so let's take a look at this she's a Fountain City woman Tennessee and she's accused of shooting her five-year-old daughter in 2019. This happened September 14, 2019 at 5.02 Balsam Drive. Let's see if we can find that. 5.02 Balsam Drive, Fountain City. Okay. Well, it just almost looks like it's giving me like a vacant lot. So I go to Boston Drive, Knoxville, Tennessee. Some drive. With the idea, I don't know. I don't know where that. Okay, so she was charged with felony murder, aggravated child neglect, false reporting, tampering with evidence and attempted tampering with evidence in the death of her daughter, Destiny Oliver. Well, the Knoxville Police Department records showed that Howington initially said the girl's father was the one to pull the trigger. And then those records also state that later in the investigation, police discovered that Howington was caught on video wiping the gun used in the shooting with a rag and throwing it into bushes. It says, it says bushes into bushes inside her home. I'm sure that must be outside. She reportedly told police she did not want them to know she had a gun in the house, changing her story to say that her other child, who was two years old at the time, got the gun from the closet and shot her daughter with it. The mother is also accused of tampering with evidence. According to police reports, she tried to break her phone to stop police from going through it. She tried to pass the phone to someone else to keep it out of police hands. And in the past, she had claimed to do this because she said there were records of her selling marijuana on the phone. The trial began with jury selection this morning. So, yeah, this may be one I follow if, you know, um, 
Let's probably start, well, I don't know if they're going to start opening statements tomorrow. Let's see, let's see if we can look a little more into this. Um, Robin Howington. Back, it's a long time to get to uh, trial, right? Wheels of justice move slowly, don't they? Okay, let me look at something. Let's see. So, Destiny was taken to the University of Tennessee Medical Center where she was pronounced dead. Howington initially told investigators an unknown man had come into her home and shot Destiny once in the chest before escaping in a black Chrysler 300. She later changed her story to say it was the girl's father who had shot Destiny and then fled in a white Chrysler 300. Authorities say they found a handgun hidden in a bush near her home. Howington accused her boyfriend, a different man than Destiny's father, of stashing the handgun, but a neighbor reportedly captured video footage of Howington herself hiding the firearm there. When investigators confronted her with footage, she changed her story again, this time claiming she wiped down the gun and hid it outside after her two-year-old son had found the weapon in a closet and shot the girl in the chest. Okay. See something here. So pretty. What else do we have? The grand jury found that Howington did unlawfully kill Destiny Oliver during the perpetration of aggravated child neglect. She was charged with six counts, including felony murder. Yeah, there's not that much other than that about this, but if the trial's starting, I mean, I'll watch it. Well, they said, okay, the trial was to begin in 2021, so I don't, and then I guess it kept getting delayed. 
probably due to the pandemic and everything else. Okay, let's go back and see. Let me just see if I can find Very interesting that um, there's very little about this on uh, and what is going on in that rust? Let's see what's going on in that rust trial. Okay, the first week of Hannah Gutierrez's Reed's criminal trial was marked by a series of eyewitness accounts from those who were on set. So let me, um, let's put this set up here. This was the set. was marked by a series of eyewitness accounts given by those who were on the set when Helena Hutchins, the Russ cinematographer, was fatally shot with a prop gun that was held by actor Alec Baldwin. What the trial is about and the case is about how did a live round of ammunition get onto the film set and into a prop gun that Alec Baldwin was holding on October 21st, 2021. I can't believe that's that many years ago already. Dave Halls, the film's first assistant director who handed the gun to Alec and injured, that killed Helena Hutchins and injured director Joel Souza was among the witnesses and experts who took the stand at the courthouse in New Mexico. Alec Baldwin has maintained he did not pull the gun's trigger. Okay. The armorer on the set at the time of the incident has been charged with involuntary manslaughter and evidence tampering and faces three years in prison. She has pled not guilty. So... Um, let me see who took Dave Halls, the film's first assistant director, was on the stand and it was very emotional, it says. And he said, and I quote, my thought was that a blank round had been loaded. He said as he was crying and talked about how he was one of the first ones to approach Helena Hutchins. 
And he said, she said, I can't feel my legs. He also, Halls also served as the film's safety coordinated, coordinator. He pled no contents to negligent use of a deadly weapon last year and was given a plea deal that was where he was sentenced to six months of unsupervised probation. The testimony that he gave in court was the first time that he spoke to the public about what happened on the set. And I quote, let's see, yeah, his answer to the prosecutor, Carrie Morrissey, when she asked why he agreed to testify, and he said, and I quote, it's important to me that the truth be known, that Helena's husband, son, family know the truth of what happened. When Carrie Morrissey questioned Halls on Guterres's read, set contact, excuse me, the, her conduct on the set with weapons, he said he never witnessed Guterres read handle herself in an improper manner. Uh, when the moments before the fatal shooting were being discussed, he got very emotional and said he was the one who handed the gun to Alec Baldwin during the rehearsal and declared the gun cold, meaning there were no live rounds of ammunition inside. Paul said during his testimony that he should have checked the gun more thoroughly and admitted that he did an improper check of the firearm. And he went on to say that he did not recall seeing Gutierrez Reed spin the entire cylinder around to ensure all bullets were dummy rounds. He wiped away tears as he said, and I quote, I let a, saf a safety check pass. Let's speak tonight. The film's prop master, Sarah Zachary, and the boss of Guterres Reed was on the witness stand Friday, and she only bought brought one box of dummy rounds to the rest set and didn't know who brought the live rounds. In the moments after the shooting, Sarah Zachary admitted that she took the live rounds out of the gun and threw them away in a state of shock and panic. She said, and I quote, it was a reactive decision. She said she told investigators about this one month after the shooting. She also spoke about how she was not satisfied with Guterres Reed during production and talked with colleagues about wanting to fire her at one point. Now, the defense attorney, Jason Bowles, said in his opening statement that his client served as both an armorer and a props assistant, which distracted her from being able to sufficiently oversee the weapons during filming. Joel Souza, who was shot, and the director on the set said that after the shooting, nothing made sense. He was shot by the same bullet that killed Helena Hutchins. And he said he remembered looking up at Guterres Reed and hearing her repeatedly say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Joel. Susa described the feeling of being shot as though someone had taken a baseball bat to my shoulder. He said he did not realize he had been injured by a live round of ammunition and that when the medics informed him of that at the hospital, the medical professionals, he could not, um, you know, comprehend it. He said it, it could not compute for me. That's his exact words there. During the cross by the defense, Souza said he recalled Halls declaring the gun was cold on set. 
opening statements, the special prosecutor Jason Lewis called Guterres as Reed's behavior on the Russ set sloppy and unprofessional. And I quote, he said, we believe that it was the negligent acts and failures of the defendant that contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death. Um, let's see. Others on the set testified, including Ross, Adiego, was it Dolly Grip, told the jury about a day on this set when there were two accidental discharges in the course of one hour. Adiego said accidental firearm discharges are not common. So if they had two accidental in the course of one hour that was with live rounds, that would be... At one point, Diego said that Guterres Reed was not as serious or professional as I'm accustomed to. He said that guns and ammunition should be under lock and key, but they would be left unattended on a prop cart. He said he voiced his concerns about the set safety with Halls and that Mr. Halls ignored me and walked away. Another grip on set, John Ziello, told the prosecutor that he came across an unmanned prop cart on set and it seemed wrong. Anyone could have done anything to those weapons. Ziello said he never reported his concerns. Now, Guterres Reed called herself a failure in body cam video. During several days of the trial, various pieces of body cam footage from the day of the deadly shooting were played for the jury. In one of those body cam clips, Guterres Reed is heard um, after the shooting when she was sitting in the back of a police car saying, I just want to get the F out of here and never show my face in this industry again. She was also recorded saying, I'm an effing failure. Uh, she was taken in for questioning after the shooting. In the video footage of that interrogation, she can be heard telling the sheriff investigator, and I quote, it's my job to check the barrel of the gun. She was also heard referencing Brandon Lee the actor who was killed on the 1993 film set, The Crow, he died after a firearm malfunctioned. As she was being questioned by the sheriff, she is heard in the footage saying that although she remembered shaking all the rounds to make sure they were dummy rounds, I wish, she said, and I quote, I wish I would have checked the gun more. Um, in another interview, she admitted that she did not have much official training and that most of her job opportunities had come directly from her stepfather, Thel Reed, who's a famous Hollywood armorer. She told the sheriff that Rust was only her second job in the film industry. And then Lucien Luke Haig, forensic science service ex expert, testified, told the jury that he examined the firearm that Alec Baldwin was holding during the rehearsal. He testified that he had reviewed the FBI ballistic reports on the revolver and also tested the gun himself. And he determined that the firearm was in proper working order, that it was not modified in any way, and told prosecutors that Baldwin would have had to pull the trigger for it to fire. It's unclear if Gutierrez Reed will take the stand in her own defense. And let's see what happened today. That was last week. Let's see what happened today as we catch up on this. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so now the ammunition supplier, Seth Kenny, gave testimony today. Um, said that he started to sense that there were efforts to redistribute blame or the cause of the accident. And said Monday that right after the accident, attorneys for Guterres Reed, as well as the relatively inexperienced Armour's father, 81 year old veteran movie consultant and sharpshooter Thel Reed, were essentially trying to assert that the live ammunition on the set of Russ somehow came through me. Knowing Thel and having been friends with him for a few years at that point, I know how much he loves his daughter. Just before the lunch break, it was read out in court that Kenny declared, shite, 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 while she still didn't do her effing job on a call with Santa Fe Sheriff's Department detective soon after the shooting that killed Hutchins and injured Rust director Joel Souza. Afterwards, Kenny rejected defense lawyer Jason Bull's presumption that he was trying to blame Gutierrez Reed for the horrible accident at the time. Okay, so the testimony on Monday, they say that uh, depending on what side of the trial you sit on, Kenny either brought vital testimony of how Guterres Reed was not up to the job she'd been hired for, or he took the stand to provide powerful protection for himself. He's an industry veteran, and he has been cast as the likely primary source of the live ammunition that ended up in the Indy Western set by the defense. Kenny told the court that he had provided a single box of 50 Colt 45 dummy rounds that had just come off the prop truck in Texas from Taylor Sheridan's 1883 series that he had recently worked on and he handed them over to the rust prop master Sarah Zachary on October 12, 2021. He looked on his phone at old text between himself and Guterres Reed that the prosecution showed on the screen in the courtroom. Kenny told the court that his last conversation with her was October 21st uh, after the shooting, which was a self-described expletive filled text. October 16th combo, that exchange was related to the accidental discharge of a blank on the set of rust. He said, calling Guterres Reed emotional. Kenny added he felt he was due an apology from the armorer and the family friend. During the cross from the defense, he became a little cagier. Kenny recounted an earlier text conversation between Guterres Reed and himself when he said, you just send me out to do these things and don't teach me. Shame on both of you, Guterres Reed wrote to Kenny. Later, under questioning from the defense, Kenny admitted he had issues with the daughter of his old friend, but he had no power to fire her from rust. It's not that I wanted her fired. She was doing a horrible job at props. I had mixed feelings about her. If I really wanted her fired, I could have gotten her fired. Okay, let's see here. But he could not give definite dates of when he drove back and forth from the 1883 set in Texas to New Mexico that possibly saw ammo moving from one location to another. And the defense, state, who has stated on a number of occasions on TV and in court filings, that he believes it was Kenny, who at least is partly responsible for the live am ammo getting on the set, 
was more than a little incredulous that the supplier had not been able to nail down those important travel dates two years after the onset shooting. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now they were, uh, both lawyers were discussing what could be admitted and not, and then they talked about uh, the now dismissed January 2022 lawsuit that Bolas, the defense attorney, filed for Guterres Reed against Kenny, and it became a matter of contention when Morrissey asked about it after both lawyers at a sidebar with the judge, Morrissey simply asked Kenny if the suit was now dismissed. He said yes, and she passed the witness to the defense who examined him for a short period before the judge called a midday break. Um, then they had Karen Kuhn take the stand, uh, the Russ Still photographer. She had a very brief testimony and she didn't offer much of a perspective on Rust. She stated that the low budget and lower tier shows were always looking to cut costs and Rust was no different in her opinion. As for what went on during rehearsal, Kuhn said, I don't recall the specifics of the incident. Let's see, Marissa Papel, a crime scene technician for Santa Fe Sheriff's Department, returned to the stand on Monday, and she examined the live ammunition that was found on the rust set and the ammunition that was found at supplier Kenny's shop. Papel was soundly schooled by the defense in his examination of the law enforcement official, the defense lawyer Bolas, Bowles, excuse me, confirmed that Papel's search of Kenny's Albuquerque, New Mexico shop was carried out weeks after the October 21st, 2021 shootings, and that that carried a risk of the evidence being lost or misfiled over that time period. Rebecca Smith self-described set mom and key craft services testified that she was asked to hold a baggie of powder for Guterres Reed calling herself a recovering addict Smith said that she believed the powder was cocaine under questioning Rebecca Smith informed the prosecutors and the court that she tossed it into a garbage can in the whole hotel hallway after she left Guterres Reed's room. After the shooting, Smith said she received repeated texts from Guterres wanting her step back. Guterres Reed wanting her step back. She testified that she told no one about the incident or the powder because she wanted to stay out of the arrest investigation. In September of 2023, she received a text from Special Prosecutor Kerry Morrissey seeking information, um, information that became part of the evidence tampering charge Guterres Reed was hit with after refusing a plea deal offer to provide more on how live rounds got on the rust set. The prosecution is expected to wrap up its case and hand over matters to the defense Later Monday, so uh, Judge Sumner has said she hopes to see the three-week-long case go to the jury by the end of this week. Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial is set to start on July 9th, also in front of the same judge. He entered a not guilty plea to the renewed involuntary manslaughter charge. He faces a maximum of 18 months behind bars and around $5,000 in fines if found guilty. And so that's up with that, right? OK. 
Okay, White Angel. Okay, you got her. Hi, Ruff. How are you feeling? Hi, Jane. You're talking about the Christie's. Hi, Mr. Electric. Hi, Manager of Three Monsters. Hello, Sassy. Hello, Kevin Margle. Um, Lindsay cannot leave the Bahamas. Wait, what are you talking about, Jane? What is Jane talking about? Are you talking about um, Hyper and Popcorn? Are you talking about the um, the woman that had that plot to kill her husband in the Bahamas? You're sore still? Oh boy. Hi, Auntie Millions. Why didn't I see you, Auntie Millions? Okay, All right. is that what you're talking about? What is Jane? Jane, Robert Shriver is dating. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I know that. I, uh, that was a while ago. Is he still, he's still dating her, huh? Lindsay Shriver, right? Yes. I don't think there's anything new on that yet. Um, I was going to check on Stampin' Up to see if what's up with her. What's up with her? Okay, let's see. Gosh, it's so weird. <laughs> I just had a thought of her, and seven hours ago there was something on her. Okay, so let's get a picture of her up here so that we know if I do. So, Shanna Gardner's lawyers filed a motion to dismiss the indictment on, mo on Monday, according to the court documents. She's facing a first-degree murder charge and the murder for hire plot against uh, her ex-husband, Jared Brittigan, who was uh, shot execution style in St. Augustine, Florida. And um, he was shot in front of his two-year-old daughter. Yep. She is the uh, daughter of the Stamping Up founder, that multi-level marketing company founded by uh, two Mormon sisters. And let's see what this is about. According to the new motion, Shanna Gardner's lawyers say that the, and her lawyer is uh, Casey Anthony's lawyer, right? Uh, unless uh, Jose Baez, unless something happened because the last time I saw her was someone else, but uh, say the lead prosecutor for the 4th Judicial District joined the team formed to screen communications that were intercepted and they contained attorney and client privilege information. The motion said an infiltration of the taint team constitutes substantial misconduct and should at least lead to the 4th State Attorney's Office being disqualified. They further stated in their motion that the actions of the lead prosecutor are demonstrating a clear lack of concern for Shanna Gardner's rights and represent outrageous government conduct. The next hearing is Thursday. Thursday, there's another hearing. Okay. So we'll have to see what happens there. And 
Um, who else were we going to check up on? Let me see. Court date set for Lindsay Shriver. Okay, let's see. A trial date. July 1st, 2024. Lindsay Shriver. Let's get her picture up there, right? So we can... There we go. And accused of planning her uh, with her lover to murder her husband. She's going to stand trial, the judge says, beginning July 1st of 2024 in the Bahamas. Other hearings are scheduled, including a status hearing on May 1st and a pretrial hearing on June 5th, where she must appear. She has pled not guilty to charges of wanting to kill her estranged husband, whom she shares her young sons with. Police say that her lover and a third man exchanged texts and planned his murder. She has been allowed to leave jail. It says in the country, in December, a judge ruled that Shriver is allowed to travel to the United States, but has to stay at her parents' home in Alabama. The Shrivers shared homes in Georgia and the Bahamas before their split. Her husband who filed for divorce, Robert Shriver, had a brief career in the NFL. He filed for divorce shortly after his wife was arrested and has since been linked romantically with Savannah Chrisley. All right, all right. So that's coming up as well. And, um, uh oh, hold on, my Google just went down really been acting funny. I probably should restart my computer, but I can't do it now because I'll lose you all. All right. Let me... We're also going to look about uh, something about Gypsy Rose Blanchard in a minute here. But let me get I have to get you guys back on the screen because I can't see you. Back on the screen now. Okay. Hang on one second. I just have to go in and do something right here. Hang on. Oh, we can do that. Hold on. Okay. All right, 
I'll just take care of something there before I forgot. Hold on, let me just make sure that I did that. So I don't think that I hit save when I did that. Okay, I did. All right, never mind. Okay, let me go to uh, Gypsy because Nick, uh, go to John, has spoken out, right? Okay, so he apparently called himself Mr. Smiley in a creepy email to the New York Post. In the email, he appeared polite and childlike, using smiley faces six times during a 109-word correspondence. Stay positive, healthy, and safe, Mr. Vago, with a smiley face. He said, referring to a New York Post reporter at the end of the exchange, true sincerity, Nicholas, and he put in parentheses, Mr. Smiley, go to John. Uh, let's see. And then prior to that, his attorney filed an appeal for a new trial. We've gone through over that appeal, I believe. Um, go into And there was an incident, um, I don't know why it's coming about about uh, a McDonald's incident, and according to the police report, which I'm looking at right now, it says summary on March 11th, 2013, at around 1918 hours, Squad 312 Officer T. Weston was dispatched to 1635 East Main Street McDonald's in reference to an indecent exposure. During the investigation, Nicholas P. Godijohn, a white male, born in 520-89, it's not my daughter's birthday, was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon and disorderly conduct. Godijohn was transported to the station for processing by Officer L. Hallmark. At the station, Godijohn was processed and booked and released on the charges. This was done per the authority of Lieutenant Walschleiger. Now, apparently, what he was doing there was at a McDonald's all day looking at uh, some very explicit uh, material and
He uh, apparently was found with his hand in his pants and said he was um, scratching himself. Had an itch, apparently. Okay. Okay, let's see, here we have, what do we have here? doing here gypsy gypsy's doing makeup and wow she has got like a heavy airbrush going on uh, some kind of a filter <laughs> Somebody said, I guess she's promoting a product called Lux, and she, someone should ask Lux if their product is so good, why does their spokesperson need eight filters? Uh, let's see. Yeah, the best spokesperson uses 900 filters. Her lip liner is atrocious. Her stomach is grumbling. Why? I feel like vegetables, maybe. I don't know. Uh, what is she doing? I don't know. I tried to look for... I don't know if it's on TikTok or where, where she's doing this. And a lot of people are like really have turned on her um, because she's not doing any of this advocacy work. She said the people don't think this, this murderer should be glorified, which she was and still is by some. But uh, a lot are just now going completely the other way. And I guess it's on TikTok. And so she's been sent products, you know, free products and someone said she got her upper teeth fixed. Maybe it was that guy that was going to do her upper teeth for her. I don't know. Or maybe she has one of those false teeth things, those flippers in. I don't know. She hit her head, uh, her, her face with the uh, thing, and she's like not even in a, I don't know where the heck she is trying to do it. But she's definitely got like a heavy airbrush filter on. It's ridiculous. And it says unfiltered. <laughs> Gypsy Rose, please. Who are you fooling? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see. What is this? I 
finish this gypsies. Oh my gosh, it's scary. Moving into the house. So what is this one? Apply brief. Okay, so Nicholas Godijohn's attorney filed his reply brief today. Let's see what it says. It says in his initial brief, Mr. Godijohn argues that the motion court erred in denying post-conviction relief because Mr. Godijohn proved deficient performance and a reasonable probability of a different result. Mr. Godijohn argues that his trial counsel failed to fully investigate and present evidence from a qualified neuropsychologist specializing in autism to support the diminished capacity defense, and he argues that he was prejudiced because the testimony of a neuropsychologist specializing in autism would have caused the jury to have a reasonable doubt as to the deliberation element. Respondent concedes that Dr. W testified regarding the issue of deliberation. It's a mischaracterization that the two rational actors were having a rational conversation for themselves, each representing a set of logic that impeccable in its own design. Dr. W went on to testify that Mr. Godijohn's mind was in turmoil. Nevertheless, the respondent argues that Mr. Godijohn did not prove his claim because Dr. W did not state his ultimate conclusion on the element of deliberation. The state cites Duke and Zarhouni to argue that Dr. W was required to testify to the ultimate issue of deliberation before his testimony could establish the two Strickland prongs. Okay. But testifying to the ultimate issue is not an element of a Strickland claim in an effective assistance of counsel. Even the case law cited by the respondent only requires that the evidence be relevant to the mental state not that the expert state his opinion on the ultimate issue. Okay. And then it says, Dr. W provided testimony relevant for the finder or fact, a finder of fact to determine the ultimate issue. But Dr. W also refrained from crossing the line into inadmissible testimony at the prosecutor's insistence. The cases cited by the respondent are distinguishable because the experts in those cases never opined that the defendant had a mental disease or a defect. In contrast, Dr. W. testified that Mr. Godijohn had ASD since he was a child, and the condition affects all his thoughts for his entire life. Missouri courts have held that conditions in the family of Asperger's and autism qualify as mental diseases or defects. When the prosecutor made an objection at an evidentiary hearing, Dr. W testified as an offer of proof that Mr. Godijohn's thinking at the time of the murder was characterized by his autism. Dr. W was not required to come out and state the legal conclusion. Mr. Godijohn did not deliberate. Mr. Godijohn did not deliberate because the jury can reach the same conclusion through reasonable inferences from the relevant testimony. Respondent cite Zink and Johnson to argue that Mr. Godijohn did not establish prejudice due to the overwhelming evidence of deliberation. As Mr. Godijohn argued in his initial brief, the declaration of overwhelming was made in this case before Mr. Godijohn had an 
opportunity to present his Rule 29.15 evidence. Dr. W's testimony establishes a reasonable probability of a different result because his testimony would cause the jury to consider the ultimate issue of deliberation differently. The newly presented evidence recolors or recharacterizes the earlier evidence. The court should reconsider the overwhelming determination in this case and find that Mr. Godijohn established Strickland prejudice. Would any jury conclude that Mr. Godijohn had cool reflection when an expert in neuropsychological disorders had testified that as a result of ASD, the conversation in Mr. Godijohn's head was turmoil instead of two rational actors. For the reasons stated in this brief, in addition to the reasons stated in his initial brief, Mr. Godijohn respectfully requests that the court reverse the findings of the motion court and vacate Mr. Godijohn's convictions and remand the case to trial court for a new trial. Okay, so that was that, and uh, he wants a new trial. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Oh my gosh. Scares me. Okay. Apparently, let's see, where's this from? <laughs> Someone said they started writing Gypsy in August of 2022, and she opened up to this person. So again, Grain of salt, there are some text messages here. It says, need advice, so I'm pretty sure I sometimes overthink things, but maybe my feelings are better voiced with someone other than on my husband's shoulders because really he can't change how I feel about this and there is nothing he can do in this matter. I feel like I don't fit in with Ryan's family. Like they accept me only because of him making it so. They are a nice Christian family with good morals, and I'm the girl from the dirty side of the track, Jeno. Even in the beginning, Ryan's friends always would discourage him, making comments like, be careful, she's using you. Even his brother to this day says comments like, she will come out of prison and have another guy in the house so fast, you're a fool, blah, blah, blah some more ignorant crap. Sad part is Ryan's brother is a total loser who has been in the jail scene himself, so I'm being smack talked by a dope head. And then on the flip side, his crack hoe baby mama, Ryan's brother's baby mama. Let's see. Shows up for Christmas and brings Ryan a gift for us and our new apartment and everyone is just kumbaya. All these people are his people and they say, oh, we accept her, but they say the occasional negative comments. I feel the real truth is if I wasn't married to Ryan, his friends and family wouldn't give two shites about me as a person. I'm not a bad person. I'm not using anyone. I may not be high quality, but I feel like I'm not prison trash just because I made one mistake. One mistake. I'm too good for a bad boy, but I'm not good enough for a good one. That is how his world makes me feel. Now just him, 
I feel like I am loved and truly embraced, but hardcore bluntness to the people around him, all I am is tolerated. His mom is super sweet to me, but sometimes I wonder if it's because she actually likes me or is it because I'm married to her son? Pretty much everyone else probably would see him with a nice, good reputation gal, which is not me. I know I married him, not everyone around him, but all I'm saying is I wanted to be that, that girl the girl truly embraced by whoever my person's family was going to be with only the best praise and hope for our future together. But why do I feel with all the negative comments, I get a family who sees me as some prison piece of ours who has the affection of their sweet, wholesome Ryan. It all builds up in some things I feel does it need to be voiced only copied with excuse me coped with because i can be a little emotionally crazy sometimes but this was on my heart i might be wrong about how they view me but all i know is most are on guard when it comes to me and my little divorce alarm bell freaks out didn't make them feel at ease. This is on me though. Live and learn on that. I'm trying to prove my worth and show I am better than what they think. Flashing my status as a public figure of inspiration hasn't been successful at doing, doing that. It all builds up in some things I feel, oh, excuse me, uh, it's a public figure doesn't, where did she put this? I mean, it hasn't been successful at doing that, so maybe more hands on them with them in person and them seeing how much I love Ryan will show my true character. My dad loves him. My stepmother has always been seemingly supportive, but has her moments that she is only supporting me and not him. So like a few months ago when Ryan and I had an argument, she basically sidelined him and told me I should get the marriage annulled. And then if I want to date him later, I can, but it's better just to get the annulment. Three days before I got married, she told me to wait and talk me out of it. So I mean, I feel like they like him, but they have a certain level of caution. I recently came into some moolah and so they want my money to be untouchable to him even though we are married and do want to build a life together they have high expectations for him to take care of me provide for me like getting our own place is all on his shoulders and he can't touch any of my money to be able to provide for us that to me isn't fair they want him to shoulder the weight of two people on one person's salary. With his salary and a little help from my trust fund, we can get a nice arse house, but my parents won't allow him to do that for us right now. They're still cautious about us getting anything. Um, do, 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 do. Together like a house because they want to make sure he can't get to my money in case we don't work out and end up divorcing, which I understand, but I love Ryan and want to start having children soon. So eventually they need to trust that he won't take advantage of me and retain my money and let me pitch in something for our stability. Other than that, they like him. And then another one says, hi, so it's been a rough week for me, so I didn't write much. I made the decision to separate from my husband we have only been married nearly four months and I realized that I was not ready for marriage. It has been a roller coaster of emotions and I am taking his emotions as my own, so it's been draining. This is um, prior, let me see here. Hmm.
We're gonna see what else is going on. Gypsy Rose filming was done. Let's see what she did filming at Nina P's Cafe. What's that about? Um, okay, so there, there she's being treated like a celebrity, yeah. Posing for pictures in some restaurant where she apparently was filming and Nina P's Cafe. posted this picture of which yeah I'm thinking she's a celebrity right um hmm I don't oh, quiet. Oh, let's see. What is this? Oh. So the issue is, is you. All right. All right. That's enough of Gypsy Rose. Um, let me go back to this and let's see what's happening now. Anybody else? Thursday. Oh yes. Let me. We are not having an auction on Wednesday because I am going out of town on Wednesday. And I don't want to have to rush back like a lunatic. And then even if I get in, then it's too rushed. I can't handle it. It's too much, too much pressure. I hate being under the pressure. So we're going to have our regular Wednesday auction on Thursday. The start of the auction will probably be earlier. Um, look for a thumbnail coming soon. And who knows if there may even be a pop-up at some time tomorrow. I'm not saying there will be. I'm not saying there won't be. I'm saying there could be. I don't know. Anyway, yes, we're at cookie time. But, um, yeah. That's, I guess, with uh, what's going on. And uh, as for Madeline Soto... I don't see any uh, updates over there either, but I think there may be uh, that car and the fact that they've called off the search is kind of telling us something with Elijah View, but I don't know, right? We'll have to see. Okay, now, oh, what is going on, Word Cookies? already the end of March.
Am I sus Yes, I am, Auntie Millions. Are you? I'm very suspect of the mother. I'm sorry, there were too many red flags, right? Sure, that's, I mean, 100%. Did you see, I mean, how did the mom miss that she left the house? Yeah, well, the mother was lying that she went with uh, him to drop her off in the church parking lot, right? Complete lies. Yeah, very, very suspect, absolutely. I think, um, well, Craziness, I think. I tried stat. She was too calm, too composed. I haven't seen anyone say, oh my gosh, Auntie Millions, they're saying it in so many, I've been saying it, and so many people are saying it. Are you serious? I said it since I started looking at that case. The minute I saw her interview, I said there were red flags. The police say she was deceased before he put her in the car. Well, she is arrested, but just not, they're both arrested, not on um, the murder yet. Yeah. Oh, it's all around there. Believe me, there's a lot of people who are heavily suspect the mother. Heavily. You bet.
thought that I'm lit up about this case. Oh, well, I was on it um, the other night and uh, talking all about the interviews. I went over it word for word of the father's interview and the mother's interview, not the father, the step, the boyfriend's interviews. Um, and I was highly suspect of the mother and, and the things she did and the inconsistencies with her story and all of that. No, it can't be. It can't be, Kevin. It's got to be. Start with an S or a T. That's why I had Tarns. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I mean. I know, I missed you live. I couldn't wait to chat with you about it. I know, where were you? Um, yeah, I think the mother's highly suspect. There's just so many things she said that weren't okay. And that the way they changed the whole line. And that she had to have lied about uh, them seeing her in the church parking lot because the police say that she was already deceased, right? So... It's, um, just crazy. The whole thing is just so crazy. You can't think? Okay, don't worry about it. Don't think, Kevin. Don't think. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, but the mother, come on. So, yeah, we'll have to talk about it. I think there's, yeah, there's definitely going to be charges coming um, for both of them, right? That they're just, uh, did you see her LinkedIn? Yeah, I did. I saw that and I saw a bunch of stuff from her Facebook and... I don't, does she have another, any other children? I just find that so disturbing that what was found on his phone and all of that stuff, I mean, ugh. Very disturbing, very disturbing. Okay, thank you, Kevin. A pace. A pace. 
She's CEO that'll work on a Sunday night at Mr. Kid's 13th birthday party. Yeah, and um, okay, you catch our next live. I'm going to be going to bed soon, too. Many millions. I'm tired. I am tired, girl. Okay. <laughs> you know when I'm acting like that, I'm freaking tired. Okay. Okay, well, I think I'm going to call it a night, guys. Thank you for coming in. God bless. Prayers. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, I might have a painting video for you in the daytime. Little one set with some music or something, something fun. Um, we'll see you then. Everybody be good. Love you. Bye. God bless. Prayers for all. Pray for the community. Pray for everyone. Bye. Pray for the world. God bless. Thanks for all that I need, and we'll see you guys.